Amen. Thank you, guys. What a blessing. Glad that you're here today. They will be with us tonight at the Magnolia Campus. They're uh, helping us out with a benefit concert for Sandy Caps, one of our uh, children's directors and leaders over there who's part of our children's ministry for many years, been serving the Lord faithfully. He's going to need a lung transplant, and uh, these guys have graciously agreed to just come out and for no charge or anything like that, and help us with that benefit concert. Now, you're all invited to Chili Cook-Off. No, you don't have to bring chili. There'll be people there in hazmat suits serving chili. And uh, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. You don't want to miss this over there. So you can go on the web and find the address there. And, and come on out. It starts at 5 for the dinner. And then shortly after we're finished eating, and Brandon's going to come present a concert to us. It's going to be a, a lot of fun, a lot of fellowship. It's going to be a good time to sit around with Paul and make fun of me. It's been a while well since I've done that. So. <laughs> Paul and I have uh, got some mileage together. Great times of ministry, great times of revival in churches and traveling in different areas of ministry. And... Uh, I was uh, pulling a bunch of video out the other day, and uh, one of the gifts my children gave me was for converting, watch, I'm starting to blare all over here, I don't know if you can hear it back there, but converting some of these old VHS and mini VHS to DVD and, you know, put them on a uh, digital format, and I pulled out one with, uh, uh, we're somewhere down at over Mexican border somewhere uh, doing a tent revival with the youth, and uh, of course my kids were like 12 and 13, I think, in that video, and uh, your wife was a lot younger than, uh, she was always younger than you anyway, wasn't she? So <laughs> she looked like one of the youth back then. It's good to see you're looking at least in your 30s now, all right? So <laughs> praise the Lord. Great, great folks, great, great fun, great, great memories, amen? Uh, we're going to be celebrating again, remembering the Lord's Supper. Some one asked when's the last time we did this. We did this back in November. We like to do it uh, occasionally, uh, but not so much so that it becomes rote. But we want it to always be a time of worship and always a time of real remembrance and a time where we really take time to have a personal revival in our own lives. I went back this week in, in preparation for today and just reread all the gospel accounts of the, of the Lord's Supper and then went back to 1 Corinthians 11, which so often we go to and we're talking about the Lord's Supper and what it means and read all these and just began to once again focus upon what we're going to focus on today, the Lord what he's done for us, all that it took, all that it cost for us. And I want to read this passage out of 1 Corinthians this morning as we talk about this passage. I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. I made mention before that uh, we have uh, often dealt with this issue of the Lord's Supper in our ministry overseas and in third world countries, even in Bulgaria, we've talked about the Lord's Supper. It's, we train pastors and work with pastors and develop pastors in their ministry in different parts of the world. This question comes up in these conferences often about the Lord's Supper and who should take the Lord's Supper and who should not take the Lord's Supper. One pastor will ask something like, well, I, if I know a church member in the church is not walking with the Lord and has sin in their life, then should I forbid him from taking the Lord's Supper? That's come up in multiple conferences. Uh, there are other denominations that will they tell you, if you're not part of their denomination, then you can't partake in the Lord's Supper. There are churches who kind of hold that same autonomous right, as every other church should have the autonomous right to make decisions. But they'll say, well, if you're not a member of this church, then you can't take the Lord's Supper. It's called closed communion. At Believer's Fellowship, here we do not practice closed communion. In answering the questions for pastors about who should I let take the Lord's Supper, it's is pretty clear that that's not the pastor's job. That's the individual's job. Let a man examine who? Himself. Himself. I don't examine you in this. You don't examine me in this. But I ought to take heed to the warnings of the Word and look at my own heart and look at my own life and determine, you know, 
am I supposed to take the Lord's Supper? Now, the obvious thing here is not for you to make a decision not to take the Lord's Supper. It's for you to take the Lord's Supper. You say, what if I have something in my life? Well, the, the answer is pretty simple. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the, the, the motive here, the, 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 the emphasis would be upon if I come to this time and I start remembering all the Lord's done for me and I see something in my life that, that is not right with God, then I do take this opportunity to have personal revival in my life, to get right with God, to settle this issue before the Lord and to respond correctly to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who offers forgiveness because that's what the table represents anyway. It reminds us of the grace of God or the forgiveness, all that Jesus demonstrated for us. Now, we don't practice closed communion. So you have a decision. If you're a Christian, obviously it's for you. If you know the Lord, if you're right with the Lord, that's where you, where you should take it in, in a heart that's right. But you make the determination yourself to, to say, I'm ready, I'm ready to take order. I know I need to get ready. And then use this time as we share about the Lord's Supper to do whatever the Lord's leading you to do and respond the way the Lord would have you respond. Because this is a beautiful, beautiful time that we have as the family of God together. And it is a family gathering over a Lord's meal. And it is a responsibility for all of us to examine our relationship with the Lord and even with each other. But as I was going back to the Gospels this week, I started looking at just very closely as I could when it says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it says, then he took the bread and then he gave thanks to the bread and then he broke the bread and then they ate the bread. I mean, those were the four simple steps as you follow this passage of Scripture. But it, it's, there's so much more there and it goes so much deeper for him to take the bread and he says, this is my body. Remember, he's talking about his physical body in reality. And he's making reference to the fact that he has taken a body. If you read the book of Hebrews, it comes very clear that the Lord Jesus is God himself. He's God, he's, he's God in the flesh. We talk about the incarnation. That means Christ comes in the flesh. All right? So he's human being indwelt by deity. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And now he has a human form. So he took the bread upon himself. He becomes flesh for us so that he could become ultimately the sacrifice for us. But catch the sequence. He's become the bread. He took the bread. And in the Lord's Supper, it says he takes the bread. And not only does he take the bread, at this point, he takes it and he gives thanks to the Father for the bread. Now, I, I know that sometimes we're looking at just the peripheral. We see a, a Thanksgiving offered for the bread. But, you know, in the mind of God and in the mind of Christ, he sees the whole picture. He is the bread. And he's coming. He's been sharing if you read it in John for several chapters, he's been sharing that the suffering was getting ready to take place. And in those chapters, you see the, the, the love and the compassion and the intimacy that he has with these men. And now they're gathered in this room. And he says, I have desired to have this Passover with you. And then he starts to explain that out of that Passover, there's some elements that all point to the fact that he is the Passover lamb and he's the Passover bread and he's the Passover cup and he's every part of that meal. All that it was symbolized to be is seen in him. But he takes those two elements. It begins with the bread. He says, this is my body. He takes it and then he gives thanks. I mean, just think for a moment. In his mind, he sees where he's going. He sees the whole picture. He sees the cross. He sees the suffering. He knows everything. And the worst part of it, he sees that he's getting ready to be the sacrifice. The Bible says, he who knew no sin becomes sin. He's becoming my sin. He's becoming your sin. He sees all that. And in this moment, what's he, he, he stops and he just gives thanks. You talk about humility. You talk about grace. You talk about mercies. So pictured in this moment as he lifts this bread up to his father and gives thanks. The Bible tells us, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You say, what joy? The joy of you, the joy of me coming into his family. The joy of all those who would be saved, all those who would be delivered, all those who would accept his invitation to eternal life. That joy, because of that, he endured the cross. But look at the attitude of humility and the attitude, and let me just put it the way, in the manner in which he's presenting himself and he's giving thanks. I mean, the Bible talks about suffering according to the will of God. This is exactly what he's doing. He's suffering according to the will of God. There will be times in your life, and there are times in my life, when we experience things that are within the will of God that we do not like and we don't want to deal with and we, we, we don't like to have to handle it. 
But I would think it would behoove us, it would do us well that in those times of suffering in our life, that we would approach it the same way the Lord Jesus does, knowing His suffering is upon Him, and approach it with an attitude of thanksgiving. The Bible does tell us in everything give thanks. It does not say, don't misread that, it doesn't say for everything give thanks, because there's a lot of things I'm just not real thankful for. Am I the only one here? <laughs> you may be some things right now, you're, thank you're not thankful for this, but you're very thankful in it. You're realizing the mercy of God. Your expression of thanksgiving, your expression of gratitude is an absolute expression of your faith and your dependence upon God. I'm trusting you in this. I'm believing you through this. I'm holding on to you in this. I can't do this without you. Amen. And I'm, so I'm giving you thanks. Thanks that you're omniscient, omnipresent. You're here. You're ready. You're with me. You promised never to leave me. Thank you. Jesus is giving thanks for the present as well as that which is to come. And that's the same attitude. When we face such difficult, fiery trials on our own that we can move through them, instead of being the, the complainer or blaming God or being mad at God, becoming arrogant with God, we just come back to the place of humility Amen. and say, I believe God. I believe God. Yes. He takes the bread and he gives thanks. Then he breaks it, representing that this body has been given not for himself, it's for you. That's my two favorite words in the whole book of Hebrews. You can't escape them. I haven't counted them, but they're all the way through the book of Hebrews. For you, for you, for you, for you, for you, for you. This whole thing, for you, for me. Yes. Don't forget that. For the glory of God, yes. But it's our salvation and our deliverance. And he breaks it and he divides it with those who are present in the room because the body of Christ is for sharing. It's for testimony of sharing it with others. Then it says he moves out of the Passover meal. He takes that, that, that third cup, that cup of redemption is called the Passover meal. And he says this cup, this cup of redemption is called in the Passover meal. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink this, you do it in, re, in remembrance of me. Now, catch this word. It's the cup of, of the new what? Covenant. Now, if you've been a member here long, you know I talk a lot about covenant. Because I believe it's important that if we're going to understand our relationship with God, we understand what covenant means and what covenant is. It's more than just some promises and some agreements and contractual things. Marriage is a covenant. It goes beyond just a, what the state permits. It's a, it's, a, it's a relationship that you enter into in the presence of God and you swear a holy oath, putting your life on the line until death do us part. That's a big, big statement, is it not? Well, man all too often fails with his, but God never fails with his covenant. And when you begin to understand the covenant of God, then you begin to understand the mercy of God, the grace of God, the redeeming power of God, the deliverance of God. The blood of Jesus Christ, he says, is what seals this covenant. This word, it really, it's, you could even call it the covenant of communion because it's about, it's about a relationship. Every covenant in Scripture is, is, is and it's made, and really the terminology, it's cut because it involves a sacrifice. It involves blood. Every covenant is cut based on a relationship, to form a relationship, to bond and to bring that relationship into reality and to maintain that relationship. So that when we have this covenant relationship, we enter into now a relationship with God. It's not about religion, we've said before. It's about you and I knowing God, knowing Christ, being filled with His presence, knowing His Holy Spirit in our life. We have this new relationship. But it's not just me, it's you. And it's not just me and God, it's me and you. It's not just you and God, it's you and me. And every person around you that claims the name of Christ, you're part of that communion and that fellowship that, that is taking place here. And when Paul writes this passage to the Corinthians where he's talking about the warnings and these things like this, he said, hey, there's some warnings attached to this because if you're taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and what would that be? He talks about your life not being right or your relationships. Remember, he's writing this to the Corinthian church. They're certainly a unique group. Uh, if you follow the, this first letter, they had a multitude of issues and problems. It could be any church in America today, man. And one of the big problems they had at Corinth was this mindset of it's every man for himself. I'm not concerned about you. I'm concerned about me. You know, it's what, what me and Jesus have going on doesn't involve you and me. <laughs> but if you have something going on with Jesus, it involves you and me. And involves you and everybody else that names the name of Christ and claims the name of Christ. You're all in this together. We're all in this together. This covenant is a communion. This covenant is fellowship. This covenant is relationship. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, you should rightly discern the body. And he's been dealing with about this whole issue that they're a body. 
that when many members make up this one body. And there was divisiveness, and there was strife, and there was envy, and there was jealousy. Chapter 3, he deals with me, he just says, you know, you guys are so carnal, you know. And he, said, he showed the evidence of your carnality was your selfishness. It's all about you. Hang the rest of the world as long as I get what I want. And so he's trying to remind them, you know, guys, this is, you better realize that this is not just about you. It's about the relationship you have with all the other believers in the body of Christ and your unity of the fellowship and your communion together. And you need, you need to realize that, especially when you're receiving the precious symbols of, that relate and typify and symbolize all that God has done for you, where he gave his life. No greater love hath any man than he laid down his life for his... Well, we are friends. We've been made friends of God. I no longer call you servants and slaves. I call you friends. So here we are as a group of friends this morning and family in the presence of God. So we rightly discern the body of Christ knowing that, hey, this, this is important, this relationship we have. And if I'm going to receive what's being demonstrated here with this cup that, that represents the blood of Jesus and this bread representing his body, it all talks about a sacrifice for a reason. And that reason was to bring us into a relationship, into the family of God. But we're not in this family, you know, we're, we're, we're not only children. We're in this together. And then he tells him, he said, there's more than this. He said, you need to understand that as often as you take the Lord's Supper, there's a message here. And it's a message that we bear in unity, and it's a message we bear together. And the message is the proclamation of the cross. It's the gospel. It's the message of our salvation. It's the message of our, our deliverance. It's the, it reflects the high price that had to be paid if we were going to be saved. It reminds us that we're all sinners and we can't pay the price for ourselves. That someone had to come, take my place, take your place, or there'd be no hope for us. And someone did come, and that someone was the spotless and perfect Lamb of God who took on human form and gave that human form, gave himself for our sins. No hope of heaven, no hope of salvation. All we would have to look forward to is an eternity in judgment and damnation and in hell. But we don't have that to look forward to because he came. So we have in the Lord's Supper and in our, even our taking the Lord's Supper a message of the gospel in symbols. But it's not just this message, all right? Catch this, and this is, why he, this is why he gives this word to the Corinthians, to the church in general, to all of us that, hey, it's not just in taking this. He says there's a testimony involved in this. He said whoever takes this and eats this or drinks this in an unworthy manner, now, let's, let me move back to that word a little bit on manner because remember the manner in which Jesus shared it with the disciples? It's the same manner that we share it today. That manner of humility, the manner of thanksgiving, the manner of the fellowship of the moment. I, I shared with our campus this morning those chapters or three or four chapters coming up to the cross chapter of the, of the gospel of John and each of the gospels. You see the Lord Jesus interacting with his disciples on a, a deeper, deeper level. Now there's such intimacy, there's such love. There's, these are they're like final words that are coming to them in those chapters. I'm going to go. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to send another. There's going to be difficult times. You need to, you need to honor God. You need, and over and over through the Gospels, you must love one another. Even Peter, who denies the Lord Jesus Christ, shortly after the Lord's Supper, Jesus finds him later, remember, after the resurrection, and they're there on the seashore, and they're sitting by the fire, and what's the Lord Jesus telling him to do? Feed my sheep. Love my sheep. You love me? Then love them. You love me? Then feed my sheep. You love me? Then care for the flock. That's the same message to all of us. We love the church. The Bible says, hereby we know that we're the children of God because we love one another. Now, I think it's exciting to be part of one of the most loving churches I've ever been in my life. But also know there are dangers to such unity. Satan will always seek to put you at odds with some brother, some friend in Christ, some, some sister in the Lord. You guard yourself against those things. You watch it carefully because you must maintain this testimony. It's about conduct in your life. And it's a dangerous thing is what Paul's saying if you're not right with God and with others. So we look at the message of the gospel, and what does the message do? The message changes us. He's saying if the message hasn't changed you and it's not changing you, then you probably ought to be right, really aware that this is going to be trouble for you. I think a great picture of this is obviously when you're seeing the, the, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he deals with the disciples. 
You know how he sent them to the upper room for this event. And they were to prepare the room. And part of preparing the room was having it ready to, that when people would come into the room off the street, that their feet would be washed in preparation for the Passover meal. But no one was there to wash the feet. None of the disciples, they weren't going, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like some of you guys, you know, you, you hang around each other all the time. You, you ain't about to wash the other guy's feet. They stink. You know, he can wash his own feet. But this was an attitude of worship and service that had to be carried out. And it was an act of humility, and nobody did it. So Jesus gets up and dons the apron and the, ba and ba and the ba basin of water and begins to wash their feet. And then you see Peter. As he comes to Peter, oh, Lord. <laughs> I, I, here's, the, here's the passage from John. It puts it this way. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Baptize me, Lord. <laughs> Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he's completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Peter said, wash all of me. He's ashamed. He knows he should have been washing feet. But the Lord was saying, those who have bathed need only wash their feet. What does that mean? If you've come to Christ, you have bathed. You've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. You have received the gift of Jesus' as righteousness that you stand in today. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation upon your life. But when we go out as the children of God, living in this world that we live in, we have a tendency to get dirty feet. We say things, we do things, we act in ways we shouldn't. We know grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We know are contrary to the will of God for our life. That's why in Scripture when it says in 1 John, you know, if you say you have no sin, you're just lying <laughs> and you're not, you don't do the truth. But if we would confess our sins, he's talking to, to, to people who know the Lord. If you confess your sins, the plural, the, those, the, the dirt on your feet, if you get that right with God, if you confess your sins, God's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I think that when we receive the Lord's Supper, we understand that it's a time when we, we come and we say, Lord, I need my feet washed. There are things in my life that are not right. As Paul was singing, there are things we need to lay it down, let it go. It's time to go be what God's called you to be. It's time to, it's time to quit holding on to what might just be your opinion, your attitude, your preference, and see what God wants to do in your life. So, as with every time we receive the Lord's Supper, we rehearse that moment in time. I don't know if the Lord would allow us or not. To, I don't know that when I die and get to heaven, knowing the timelessness of God, that we'll be able to see anything in the past or not. It would well be within the capacity of, of God to reveal us anything He wanted to reveal us. But I certainly think there was a couple of events that I would certainly want to attend in, in history would be the Lord's Supper crucifixion and I wouldn't want to miss the resurrection just like to see the look on the Roman soldier's face <laughs> the pricelessness of that moment but I think that's why we have this to remember we read it there's a clear picture and I think that as we reflect upon what the Lord has done it should bring us to a place to realize if there are errors in our life that aren't right so I'm going to ask you to stand with me and let's take some time before the Lord, before we share in communion together.